the next presentation is about something that is very dear to me because uh, you will see the reason in a second, which is cross-linking at the slit lamp. These are my financial interests for this topic. Now, a few years ago, we realized that besides keratoconus, there is a second huge unmet need that might be um, that might be uh, taken care of with crosslinking. And this is how PAC crosslinking was born back in 2008 with the first publication. And the unmet need is infectious keratitis. And we speak about a totally different uh, dimension here, about millions of new cases worldwide every year. It's one of the leading causes of global severe visual impairment. Antibial, uh, antimicrobial resistance, antibiotic resistance is a huge issue that will come up in the next years. And we have a lot of diagnostic challenges and therapeutic challenges because it is not very easy sometimes to differentiate between bacterial infections, fungal infections. And lastly, the cost factor is, is extreme. And I'm not talking about medication costs, I'm talking about doctor's costs. In many countries, the medication for infectious keratitis might be affordable, but we are not. So the patient will maybe come to the ophthalmologist or optometrist once, maybe twice, but not eight times in a row over three weeks for a corneal ulcer. So knowing all these unmet needs, we started developing a vision, which means everything we hear here in, in, in this beautiful symposium today on keratoconus management, in fact, is for a small part of the world population of those who can afford us. Um, what about the other 85% of the world population that will never see the interior of such an operating theater for a cross-linking procedure? So the question is, how can we democratize access to corneal cross-linking? This, for example, was uh, my uh, operating room in the University Hospitals of Geneva. And the vision would be, why can't we cross-link like that? So let me tell you why, how and why we, we came to this, uh, to this conclusion. First of all, if we look at uh, the global perspective, then we have different challenges in different types of countries. If you look at, a, at an industrialized country, then cross-linking at the slit lamp would have one major advantage, it would reduce costs because every minute of our operating room costs a lot of money and a simple slit lamp is less expensive than a full blown infrastructure of an OR. S second, I do not want to take an infectious keratitis into the same OR I perform my cataract surgeries in. So you always have to take very special precaution, have this patient come at the end of the list and so on. And lastly, if you have a highly portable device that is mobile, well, if you have several locations, you can just use it in several locations. Other countries might face different uses. And uh, if we take an LMIC like India with highly industrialized um, um, mega cities, and then larger areas, remote areas that are underserved, then you could start serving remote areas that have simply no access to ophthalmology. You could increase the coverage. In other words, democratize the access to CXL. And this is what we were going for. Now I will play David's advocate and say, well, if you want to take it to the slit lamp, I have two obstacles. How can a patient stay at the slit lamp for half an hour? in the case of keratoconus treatment. And what about the risk of infection? Let's look at these two issues separately. First of all, time spent at the slit lamp. Well, it's not half an hour anymore for keratoconus. We know that. In, if you look at one of the most widely used uh, epi of uh, standard cross-linking uh, regimen for keratoconus, it's the 10 minutes, nine milliwatts continuous light. So. Uh, this is my standard regimen if I treat a young adult patient. If I'm facing a child, okay, I will go back to what is the most efficient, which is Dresden. I would not treat a child at the slit lamp, but any starting a young adulthood, absolutely. So 10 minutes for keratoconus treatment, that is totally feasible at the slit lamp. 
What about puck cross-linking? Well, luckily, oxygen, um, oxygen dependency is not the same issue as it is in CXL. So we showed a few years already, and we have a backup of several clinical studies that have been published or are impressed by our group now, that we can accelerate to three minutes with the same efficacy as the Dresden protocol. So the, 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 latest, uh, the latest clinical results we achieved now were done in 180 seconds of irradiation, and this is totally feasible at the slit lamp. So time spent at the slit lamp, I think we can solve that problem. The second uh, argument that I hear often, uh, that, I, that I often hear is, what about the risk of infection? Well, let me show you this slide. Please remember that whenever you perform a cross-linking procedure, you do not only stiffen the cornea, you do four different things. You stiffen it, you increase the resistance to digestion, and effects number three and four mean you kill everything on that surface and within that stroma. You kill keratocytes, you kill bacteria, you kill fungi. And you do this in every cross-linking procedure. So if you perform a CXL for keratoconus, don't be fooled. You do not only stiffen the cornea, you increase its resistance, and you kill anything living in the cornea, which in this case will be the keratocytes. So the cornea is sterile at the end of every CXL and PAC-CXL procedure. In other words, if you have a mother coming in with a scratch in her cornea telling you, oh, my, 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 toddler, my toddler girl scratched my cornea two, two hours ago, this lady you see at your slit lamp is more infectious than an open corneal surface at the end of a CXL or PAC-CXL procedure. So why do we not go to the slit lamp with it? So I do not think that the risk of infection is substantial. So the question was how to simplify cross-linking, bring it to the slit lamp. Then the first step was taken when my MD-PhD student, Olivier Richaud, came to see me um, nine years ago in March. So exactly nine years ago, showing me um, this image, uh, uh, this Goldman tip. This is a consumable Goldman applanation tonometry tip. And he has glued an LED on it at the time. It was a nine milliwatt LED telling me, look, the modern LEDs, this was back in 2011, the modern LEDs are so small, I can fit them on the, on the tip of a Goldman. And then we looked at each other and thought, well, if it fits on the tip of a Goldman, let's put it on a Goldman. A few days later, Olivier came, came back with a, a lot of wires. I don't know whether this video is showing, but he basically put, put this into, into action, and this is, this is the, first, the first essay. Now, nine years, no, um, and, and then we started defining the requirements, and we thought, well, if we put it on the slit lamp, we need something mobile, lightweight, should not be only be used at the slit lamp, but should also be uh, applicable in an operating room on a stand, should cover all the intensities, should cover continuous light and pulse light, and should be battery operated, and above all, inexpensive, global access. So nine years later, we have the CI device, and the CI device is a device that fulfills all these criteria. It can be mounted on a sit lamp, but it can also be used the conventional, we call it the classic way, in the operating room, if you're not comfortable with uh, the initial approach at the slit lamp. It delivers 3, 9, 15, 18, and 30 milliwatts per square centimeter in pulsed light and or continuous light. It has an optimized beam profile, so more intensity in the periphery. Irradiation zone is 5 to 12 millimeters. And it works with the USB-C charging device. So worst case, if you are highly mobile and you forgot the charger, use your Samsung or Android phone USB uh, charger or your Apple laptop charger to recharge that machine. And uh, as you can see, it can easily be mounted on, on over 30 different Huxtrite type and size type slit lamps or in the operating theater. That's the basic idea behind it. 
And we have programmed a number of uh, preset protocols, the Dresden protocol, the nine milliwatts, 10 minutes continuous light protocol. This, these are epi off protocols. Then an accelerated protocol here. This is the transition to puck crosslinking, but puck crosslinking even better with 30 milliwatts for four minutes. So this is more fluence. It's 7.2 joule instead of 5.4. Then we come into pulsed applications. You can use this one. This is Cosimo Mazotta's protocol. It's a very interesting one for Yontophoresis assisted epion, transepithelial crosslinking. I believe that this one will, uh, will change a lot in the field because you do not need an oxygen mask to perform epion crosslinking using this protocol. Then there is another pulse protocol and the sub 400 protocol that I've mentioned in my previous talk will be updated in a firmware in, in autumn and also be available. And then all you need to do is to indicate uh, your thickness in micrometers immediately before irradiation and the machine calculates the fluids. Um, now let's see whether this uh, video will run yes or no because this is a, a brief overview about how the first how step this in should work in the next slit lamp is applying anesthetics. We use both oxybuprocaine and tetracaine and we give these I'm drops one fine. after the other. And okay. we repeat this twice within 10 minutes. So a total of three applications of both drops. Inserting the speculum is a standard step in any ophthalmic procedure. This speculum is special because it's an open wire frame. So it is very light and it does not pull down the lid due to gravity. Removing the epithelium is performed using a sterile cotton swab that has been damped in 35% ethanol and then the cornea is tapped for 60 seconds. So use this movement in a circular fashion and after 45 or 50 seconds you will see how the epithelium loosens. As you can see here, you see the folds of the epithelium in the center of the cornea and then after the 60 seconds, you perform more movements. And now we apply gentle pressure on the cornea. And as you can see, the resulting erosion is nicely centered and approximately eight millimeters in diameter. The next step is not happening at the slit lamp, but in a reclining chair. Apply a pad on the side for projection against the riboflavin, and then measure your corneal perimetry. And it's always handy to have a perimetry map, and then use an ultrasound device to measure the thinnest point for documentation. Now applying the riboflavin takes 20 minutes and you should apply riboflavin roughly every two minutes as you can see here. Mounting the CI device is rather simple. Move away the illumination arm and mount the adapter. Secure the adapter Just remove the protective cap. Mount the sterile cap and place the device with the user interface directed towards you onto the slit lamp. As you can see, the working distance is roughly 32 millimeters Basically, you put the apex of the cornea into focus and then you automatically have adjusted for the correct working distance. Switching on the device requires you to scan the label and then you can choose between the different protocols provided.
once you have made your choice of a protocol you confirm your choice by pressing the OK button. Irradiation is then started by pressing on UV. So this basically is, um, is uh, how uh, crosslinking would be performed. In puck crosslinking, you do not need to remove the epithelium. In, in keratoconus treatments, for now, we would still remove, but I am quite confident that in one or two years, we will have an epi on crosslinking that does not require additional oxygen. It's just a sophisticated combination of pulsed light, high fluence, and, um, and maybe iontophoresis based applications. And then you, you can directly crosslink at the slit lamp without removing any epithelium. Um, the device comes uh, with a kit that contains the speculum and the sterile cap plus. Uh, the riboflavin and now I would like to make an announcement we have been waiting for for a long time we were blocked a little bit by the coronavirus but um, I didn't even uh, ask authorization of my CE the, of the CEO of the company but let me just tell you that the device has received the CE mark um, this early this week not only the device but also the riboflavin and not only for keratoconus but for ectasia after LASIK for PMD for infectious keratitis, so puck crosslinking will not be um, will not be an off-label use. It will be a CE marked use, um, as well as for sterile corneal melting and valus keratopathy. Now, this this is, I think, quite a quite a breakthrough for this technology that uh, should be available in in a few weeks already. Now that the CE marked has been approved. One question we get uh, uh, very often, and this is the very last slide, so I will finish in the next 30 seconds. Does the vertical position of the riboflavin, does it interfere with cross-linking because riboflavin would migrate down due to gravity? Um, the short answer is no. We had, um, we had uh, a master student uh, do a little study and even one hour of vertical positioning does not substantially change the riboflavin distribution in the cornea. So don't worry, the riboflavin will not just go down due to gravity. So in conclusion, slit lamp crosslinking will be affordable, increase the coverage worldwide, serve underserved remote areas, and democratize access to crosslinking technology.